Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and welcome. Uh, is everybody seeing and uh, hearing me nice and clear? Mustafa, have you got me? Yep, I've got you. All, all that clear. Fantastic. Well, thank you to everyone at Torrens University for making the time uh, at the end of the day, a very cold day nationally, to tune in. Um, this is a very exciting topic. Um, let's start by saying it's a very stressful topic for many. Um, today's discussion, I, I want to try and make as interactive as possible. Um, I don't want it to be a purely academic exercise. I, I want to give you some real world commercial information as it's happening. Uh, what's going on, what are businesses doing, who's suffering, who's gaining. Uh, I, I want to share as much as I can and, and field as many questions. I, I think given the time constraints, uh, we may take questions later via email and I'm happy to reach out and keep in contact with students and other academics. Um, but again, thank you for having me here. And Mustafa, I've never had such an introduction uh, be so positive and wonderful. So now I've got to live up to that. Um, so what we might do, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen with you. I've got just got a few slides to share today uh, and I'm going to try and move backwards and forwards from the presentation to talking to you and providing a bit of life in this presentation. OK, um, so let's uh, let's start. So this uh, this presentation is, is thank you, Mr. Fur has been supported by um, my fellow academics at the University of Oxford. Uh, as, as well as Torrens University for hosting it. Um, as a board member of the IMC, uh, we'd like to support this talk and, and the company that I work for, Jalby Management Consultancy, uh, our work has actually exploded in the face of COVID-19. So um, here we are able to share this and, and that picture there um, is very provocative and I'll let you know where that comes from um, in a second. My profile, yeah. which Christopher has yeah, yeah. So, so, sorry, Dan, are you sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah. We can't uh, see. Uh, can, can, I can't see it. See, think, no. If you want okay, to not getting that? Much, no, we're not getting it. Can't okay. see it. Hang on now. Got anything there? That's yeah, good. there we go. Much better. Fantastic. Okay, okay. great. So um, this is what I was uh, sharing with you. Sorry, but it's my front cover there and some of the supporting organisations. Um, this all came about, uh, obviously, with COVID-19. I produced an article in the very early part of, of COVID-19 when we were very unsure globally as to what would happen. Uh, there were predictions of an absolute apocalypse right through to this being a very minute a uh, small blip on the radar. So as, as Mustafa has explained, the presentation structure today will cover these key questions with a short Q&A session uh, that I think you'll have a chance to shoot through questions to Mustafa who can field them through to me and I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Uh, but this is the article and you're welcome to go to Business Acumen magazine uh, and have a look at this article which drew a lot of attention um, since it was published and Business Acumen magazine is a really good online resource for a range of articles geared towards Australia, but also globally. Uh, this drew a lot of attention and as a firm, we were uh, approached uh, and myself personally approached through LinkedIn quite a bit as this was published. Um, publishing articles on COVID-19 has become uh, a really difficult exercise in that the information today is very different tomorrow. So what information I, I have for you even here today in terms of statistics has already changed to some degree. Um, so I've tried to keep my statistics and my information broad in terms of monthly changes rather than day to day because the market is so volatile at this time. Um, this is the big question that while we're here, uh, what has happened economically? Um, we're looking at a multiple number of industries that have been really hit hard. Uh, manufacturing being a big one, we already had a significant downturn in the last 10 years of manufacturing here in Australia. Uh, so this has done no favours for many of those manufacturers. We will see that manufacturing in Australia has a big opportunity ahead. I'll touch on that as we move through. Uh, some have already capitalised on COVID-19 and are doing more business than they've done in 10 or 20 years. Um, obviously, wholesale trade, a lot of raw materials 
in goods coming out of not just China, but other places have been halted. Um, and these numbers here reflect the number of businesses in those industries that are considered vastly affected by COVID-19. Um, but within each one, we can see some are winners and some are losers. Um, even information media and telecommunications has taken a hit, um, certainly took a hit in China. There's a verified reduction in use of mobile phones and services, uh, also in other countries. And that's simply a reflection of businesses shutting down, not using phones, um, people getting rid of perhaps their home phones or their mobile phone and reducing the amount of services that they have. Obviously, recreation and personal services ha has been hit very hard. Hospitality, I, I would imagine that there are even students on this uh, seminar right now that would be studying and, and have been working in hospitality and perhaps lost their jobs. Um, my heart goes out to you if, if that is you and you're in that situation. And I'm, I'm hoping, Mustafa, that we've got some time at the end of this presentation to perhaps talk about how students or anyone for that matter looking for solutions to employment or lost employment um, can go about finding those opportunities. Um, I, I've got some thoughts on that and if time permitting, um, we'd love to share that with you. Um, economically, we can look at state by state here and as a proud South Australian, uh, it's, it's really sad to see that South Australia has been hit the hardest of the states. These numbers here reflect the numbers of businesses or the percentage of businesses vastly affected in the months of February and into March. Um, this doesn't even take into account April. Uh, this is why I wanted to draw these verified figures from completed months to share with you because it's only coming into the next 48 hours that we'll see the true reports and severity of what's happened um, during the month of April. Um, so you can see even in the early stages of February there, 15% on average of businesses were affected to quite a, a strong degree. And then that has just grown exponentially into March. Th these are really shocking figures. Um, they are scary figures, um, but the key to all of this is about what do we do? Where do we go to from here as an economy and as a nation and in terms of our global interactions with other companies and other economies out there? Um, we can see those numbers there and, and I've just included um, a bit of a quote there from Michelle Levine, the, the CEO of Roy Morgan, just talking about the billions of dollars that the Australian federal government is putting into this. This really reeks of post GFC era, but on steroids. And, and, and I know that's a real layman's way of putting it, but that's what's going on here. Um, to prop up the economy, to maintain activity and, and maintain minimal levels of GDP, uh, the government is forced to generate funds and, and put that into the economy. Luckily, we have really good vehicles for the injection of funds into the economy. Our social, excuse me, our social security system is unlike any on the, on the planet, any other. It's generous. It is actually well put together. Um, people might argue with me if they're on Centrelink and they're waiting on the phone for two or three hours uh, on hold to be able to get through. But at the end of the day, just having a vehicle where we can distribute wealth uh, or, or, or any kind of funds globally, uh, sorry, across the country to keep GDP moving, to keep spending moving, we're very lucky to have that. And that's actually allowed us as a country to stave off far more rapidly than other countries that just don't have those applications and those vehicles. Um, sorry guys, just a uh, computer stalled there. We still got my, my presentation up on your screen there? Mustafa? No, it's, it's dropped off. Oh, sorry, I'm not, uh, not sure how we've lost you there. How are we there? Yep, we're back. Fantastic. Sorry about that, guys. So let's look at what businesses are losing. And, and some of this is going to come as no surprise to people in the room. Uh, hospitality, cafes and restaurants, they're, they're the biggest losers of this equation. Most, 
but not all. I want to touch on that. I, I want to provide a, the, the negative realistic view here, but I want to make sure that there's a, a positive side and there are solutions to this. Uh, and I'll be happy to share that. Uh, accommodation, hotels, motels, resorts, and obviously cruise liners, cruise liner industry as a whole is on a complete collapse. Um, we're seeing the share values of some of the, the major cruise providers, such as Royal Caribbean, um, they've lost 80% of face value of, of their shares um, within such a rapid time. This is, this is something that they've weathered before, but really not to this degree. It's hit them hard. We look at um, hotels uh, that are reliant on international business travel, international tourism, holiday goers, uh, even domestic. No, everyone's staying indoors. And so I, I can speak from clients that I'm working with personally, we're looking already um, at some of these hotel chains seeing 80 to 90% reduction in expected occupancy that they would ordinarily have at this time of year. Um, made worse again by the fact that we are coming into winter, uh, which is a normally lower time. So really, uh, th there's two ways of looking at this. We ordinarily would have had a drop. Is that a good thing to, to have an outside force drop those numbers further? And hopefully we can recover coming back into our summer, into our prime season uh, for those to recover strongly. That may be seen as a good thing, but it certainly pushed the, 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 the drop that was already there to an almost breaking point. Indeed, we've seen hotel chains um, looking towards administration at this stage. The same with airlines. Um, this last fortnight with Virgin announcing going into administration, um, a very good consultant over at Deloitte being appointed over that. Um, that's going to be a, a huge task to seek external investment and funding of capital to make sure that uh, Virgin has a fighting chance of survival. Uh, even then, if it can be propped up, if it can be reinvigorated um, through external funding, the risk there is that even if domestic flights were to start back next week to the fullest extent, uh, normally Virgin is very reliant upon international travel. And, and not just international travel, we have to remember that's not just flights from Australia to another country. Um, we're, we're talking about people that would come into the country, say into Sydney, initially internationally, but then um, perhaps through tourism or business, be flying to multiple cities and regional areas as part of business travel sightseeing. Uh, so that's been vastly affected in the face of COVID-19. Um, real estate agencies, I'm in constant contact with a number of real estate agents uh, and, and owners um, throughout South Australia and even a couple interstate. This is a really interesting one. Um, sorry, guys. This is a really interesting one as real estate agencies uh, are sinking or swimming. Um, the supply of real estate going onto the market has reduced. Uh, there are also less buyers. There's almost a balancing effect. What we are seeing with a reduced supply is that buyers are moving a bit faster. We're seeing a lot of properties that do actually come on the market selling faster than perhaps they otherwise would. Um, but there's a lot of hesitancy for people to put their, their house on the market at this time. They're worried about a reduction in value. And we are projecting reductions in values, make no mistake about that. Uh, Adelaide luckily may be on the lower end with Sydney and Melbourne being towards the higher end, perhaps uh, depending on the recovery time, 12% in uh, reduction of values in Sydney, maybe even higher again. Um, all of entertainment, cinemas are closed, clubs are closed. Uh, one that gets uh, overlooked and not to make a joke about it, the adult entertainment industry has completely collapsed and there are already papers on all of these areas. Trades and construction, albeit not completely collapsed, uh, is under a lot of threat at the moment. People are putting off purchases. It's as simple as that. The, the purchase of a new home, construction, that's under threat. And then that has a flow on effect to tradespeople, um, contractors and the like. And obviously some professional services firms are doing it really tough at the moment. Uh, which ones are gaining? Now, this is, this is the interesting part, and, and this represents opportunity. Um, we look at some of the delivery services, uh, you know, in terms of food delivery, de delivery of staples and so forth, have gained more business. This has only driven that because people can't go and acquire goods and services in the same way themselves in every instance. 
Um, pharmaceuticals, no surprise, even down to uh, Panadol has seen increased sales um, in, in the wake of fear buying. Um, same with toilet paper, um, all of the normal staple retail goods out of Woolworths and Coles, we know that that's been increased. You can see that on your shelves when you're going in there. Uh, medical PPE providers, and it's really exciting to see a, a large company, Detmold, has been on the forefront and was already, luckily, investing into medical PPE manufacturing late last year, uh, and were able to expedite that and are now producing um, thousands and thousands of medical grade PPE masks and other applications. So the opportunity here short term may see a long term one as, as we see increased manufacturing, and I'm going to touch on that. Um, digital applications, here we are talking on Teams, we're using Zoom meetings, um, all of those applications have seen a, a really large spike in use for obvious reasons because um, I just can't meet Mustafa for a coffee down the road from Torrens anymore. I've got to do it through video and Skype and Zoom and other applications. Um, as I mentioned, some manufacturing companies have seen an increase. Um, I don't think anyone would be surprised to find that toilet paper manufacturing has seen an increase uh, and that they're working hard to keep up with demand. Um, and obviously online entertainment sources and online games has seen a really big, strong increase. Um, how does this change the economic landscape? Uh, here's some insights as to what's going to happen. I think we're going to see some potential low cost airfares and cruises as the industries recover. I'm not going to give you a timeline, but we're looking to hopefully towards October, November for a potential semi-reopening of international travel and, and other activities. We may see domestic travel in terms of um, flights look more normal again in the coming two to three months. That's a possibility, but again, it's reactive against the physical manifestation of COVID-19. Um, we will see decreased travel for some time. We can really compare and contrast this to post 9-11. People simply stopped flying, not just in the US, but globally uh, in the wake of 9-11. The same is true here. Uh, even if we opened everything up today and we allowed everybody in the world the same rights to travel internationally or domestically on planes, uh, we would see the demand reduced, even if the opportunity was there. Uh, we're going to see a, a local entertainment and hospitality outlets um, have a slow and steady recovery with overall month to month gains as international travel and cruises and things begin to take an effect, but they will take a hit for some time. Let's make no bones about it. Fear is a compelling force and fear is driving people to buy certain things and stop buying others. Um, it's frightening. Um, there'll also be a shift in job types and service offerings. Um, if I go to my next slide, what I'm talking about there, there's going to be a propensity to not work in roles that were affected by COVID-19. This will, this will represent a labour market shift. It won't be one that I don't believe this is going to be all encompassing forever and all eternity, but simply put, once bitten, twice shy. We will see people that worked in hospitality that are resistant to returning to that industry simply because they saw how quickly they could lose their job in that industry. Um, they will be nervous. Perhaps they will grab what work they can initially, but you'll see a desire for people uh, to move more away from those roles. So we may see even as, as that recovers, we may see hospitality um, uh, prove difficult to source human labour uh, and resources in that regard. Uh, governments are going to need to operate on a long-term deficit budget for some time to maintain GDP levels. Um, this is not a surprise, but uh, it is the right thing to do in the face of uh, severe economic downturns. If we compare and contrast this with the GFC and we look at the UK as a model, we saw post-GFC uh, a number of uh, years using a deficit budget but then the UK government implemented severe austerity measures, uh, and that severely uh, hampered the UK economy um, before those, those measures and those tools were retracted. Um, I, I severely hope, I sincerely hope that the Australian federal government and the UK government for that matter, um, continue to operate on sensible deficit long-term budgets with appropriate spending and stimulus um, for as long as is required. Um, we can then work as an economy federally um, towards how, how do we pay that down 
when, when the time is appropriate. We, we can deal with that when we get to that. Um, we are already seeing a decline in the demand for Chinese made goods. We will see a, a medium to long term reduction in that trend. It will recover, but I think there will be a, a lasting influence on the sourcing of Chinese made goods. The drivers for that are mostly social, uh, but also economically, uh, it's proven that a diversity of sourcing goods, whether they're raw materials or final goods, um, is, is going to become important. And I, I can see the Australian uh, economy moving towards a more diversified um, source of goods where historically a lot of goods have come into uh, Australia via China and we've been quite reliant upon that as a source. Um, I think also soon we may see an increased aggregate demand for uh, residential property uh, because we have record low interests. Uh, this is the best time for anyone trying to get out there and buy their first home. The first homeowners grants are still in effect. Uh, we are waiting on information that those may increase, not just for new, but also existing properties. Um, so if you're a real estate investor, now is a really exciting time because opportunities may present themselves. Uh, and it, it's, I think even if you're not in the market for property, if you are studying economics, if you're an economist, if you're doing any kind of commercial study there at Torrens University, I'd be watching the numbers of the real estate market uh, uh, across Australia right now because it will be it will just be really interesting to see what happens. All of these changes that have happened and the ones that are coming forward, if we were to sum this up, it's all stimulated by emotion. Uh, it's stimulated by fear by gut feelings, by people's personal experiences. And if I can share a, a funny Simpsons uh, meme on the next page here, but with a very important life lesson, um, and I, I'll never know if you're all there laughing at Homer Simpson, but oh, the truth is when emotions are high, intelligence is low. And that is proven by the fact that people are out there racing to buy toilet paper still. Um, I'm sure everybody saw the owner of Drake's just two weeks ago, um, pushing back on a on a individual that bought around about four thousand uh, toilet paper rolls, and then decided he wanted to return those and get his money back. Um, that was an emotional decision. Clearly, his emotion was quite high. He panicked, uh, and then he realised later how just how low that his uh, intelligence was. Um, let's talk a little bit about what businesses are doing to survive COVID-19. Uh, there's a really good, and, and, and this is more on the on the micro level now, product and service versatility. I'm seeing some cafes uh, switch to a takeaway model. They're producing different meals, cheaper meals. It's exciting when you see businesses try something new, even under pressure. Sometimes pressure teaches us many things. Um, there are new services. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share one that hasn't even been formally released to the market, but the owner is a good friend of mine, um, Wade Bekesi from Mercantile CPA. Um, we had an interview online just two days ago, and he is a uh, debt collection and debt management company, quite successful with contracts with large companies like Origin and AGL and other financial and financial providers. They're now offering a call centre assist service. He has these staff in place that are highly talented. They're used to making calls, receiving calls, managing complex issues. And for now, the work has reduced somewhat. And so he's able to turn that human resource into another service. There are businesses out there that have had to lay off uh, individuals in their, their company, but they still need someone to answer the phone. They need, still need someone to make outbound calls to try and generate business. This is where he's been very smart to use his human resources to provide an outsource model to new and existing clients out there. And, and, and I really get excited when I see cases like this because it means businesses like that can thrive. Uh, businesses uh, to survive really need to look at things like uh, making outbound calls themselves to their clients, maintaining the relationship with staff, even if they're laid off, um, maintaining relationships with clients, even if they're not purchasing anymore. Uh, seeking cheaper inputs and in suppliers, uh, longer payment terms. And this is also a great time to generate content. If you sit around twiddling your thumbs, 
Um, this is a great time to lift the ranking of your business online uh, by generating content and doing all of those technical things. I don't want to get too stuck into it because this is an economics and a commercial talk, not a technical one and certainly not an SEO one. But um, what a great time as even here at JLB is a couple of our staff uh, their roles become not redundant, but a little bit quieter in terms of the workflow. Um, we're able to give them work in that space and train them uh, to work with marketing and our SEO people um, so that their jobs uh, do provide meaningful value. Um, and also assessing you know, your labor uh, within your business. Um, I just wanna whiz through risk management as a science. And if anybody's majoring in risk management, this would be a good exercise. Um, risk management as a science does not change in the face of COVID-19. It's about assessment, control, reassessment, review and improve. Um, we look at the likelihood versus the consequences and what risk level does that represent? How do we control and mitigate the risk? And then re-rating based on the new likelihood and consequence and understanding the reduction. Something like this gives you a conceptual model. This is more geared towards physical work health safety, but these same models are utilised even for commercial or financial risk. Um, we can see that for any instance, um, say if we look at something in the middle there, uh, something with a rating of nine has uh, a, a severity, if it is to occur of serious injury or harm, um, and it's, it's feasible. If we implement controls, that reduce both of those, one or both of those factors, that risk clearly reduces into some of the lower uh, categories there. And, and here are some of the controls specific to not just physically for COVID-19, but for businesses, obviously PPE. It shows that you're taking it seriously, social distancing, hygienic practices, increased cleaning, barriers at point of sale, um, all of these things and working with our clients and our staff to try and um, reassure people that we're open for business. We're communicating with our clients right now here at JLB, letting them know that our clients and our people are the most important. We've taken every step, we're here to help them. And that's actually resulted in, in us being really busy, uh, more busy than perhaps we would otherwise be in April. And then obviously after those controls, we reassess, like I mentioned, the likelihood versus the consequence. That's a very simple way of looking at risk management as a science, um, something that any of the, the risk management students in the room would have come across, um, but uh, something that I feel is, is just really important to bring everything back to a sense of normalcy and how do we deal with this? Um, I'm just gonna switch back here Okay, and uh, I think, uh, Mustafa, am I back on the screen there? Uh, yep, I'm back, yeah, you're back. Thank oh, you. Fantastic. Well, I, I want to finish the, the core information here in the presentation before we move to questions and answers um, with finishing up on fear, because we've looked at what's the driver, there's a physical driver, there's an emotional driver in all of this. That's how we can simplify this, and it really comes down to fear. But fear for a business and fear as individuals um, always gives way to knowledge, bravery and hope. And this is a testing time for Australia and indeed the world, but this Commonwealth of Australia was not built by those who worked under fear and hesitation. There are opportunities. There are opportunities both for businesses and individuals. Um, we are promoting that like we never have before in this firm uh, and as professionals in this business. And I hope that as students, if you are going through a hard time right now, if you have lost your work, um, that you look towards the opportunities and look to all of this as a learning opportunity. Um, Mustafa, I think we'll leave the formal part of the presentation there. Um, thank you for, for allowing me to be a guest here today at Torrens University. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank, thank you so much, Dan. I mean, that was just incredible. Incredible. Uh, I do have some questions um, from myself and I think from the from the chat as well that I've managed to capture. Sure. Uh, we had a question from Stephen Davies um, who asked, Dan, do, do we know how the COVID-19 situation is affecting insurance companies? Absolutely. Um, this is a convoluted area and it's a great question, Stephen. Uh, there 
is no precedence of COVID-19. Not even SARS compares to it. Um, so you are seeing insurance companies receive more claims. Um, insurance is a wide field, mortgage insurance, um, employment insurance, a range of them. And, and there is just simply more applications uh, for uh, insurance payments under this situation. So they are being hit harder. And the same is going to be very true of superannuation. The government has allowed us to unlock as individuals parts of our superannuation, $10,000 this month and coming soon another $10,000 uh, for certain individuals in categories. So what does that mean? It means that superannuation companies are paying out their money that's ordinarily being invested. Uh, that has pros for the individual on a micro level. It's going to have some effects on a macro level. Um, because that's where we're going to find the financial capital to restart the economy as the controls are lifted. So the same is true for superannuation as it is for insurance. They are being hit hard. They are having to pay more. And, and where they draw the lines is a little bit up in the air in some cases. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question. Um, do you think quantitative easing measures um, the government has introduced might have negative impacts? such as hyperinflation in the long run? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And it comes up on every economics online discussion right now. It's a, cla it's a classical question. Thank you for asking it. It could do. Um, I don't think we're going to see that here in Australia. That's because of the nature of our economy um, geopolitically, um, as well as the way we base our currency. That's a whole other lecture for another day. There is a little bit of a, an issue potentially of a, a mild to moderate liquidity trap. Um, that is where um, our interest rate drops so low that it can't drop any lower anymore. Um, and there's really, there's no desire to put your money into savings account. It has, it has a whole range of possible negative effects. Um, right now though, the biggest issue is about creating jobs and spending. Modern economics places the highest goal on employment, on activity in the in the in the economy, um, so we need to focus on that. There will be other negative outcomes. I, I don't think we'll see hyperinflation here in Australia, but it is a possibility, and we do need to keep it in mind. Good question. Fantastic, oh, Dad. Can I make uh, a comment, Mustafa? Yeah, sure, go for it. Can I make it? It's Greg Harper. Um, I was actually this time last week listening to. Um, Australian Young Economists sem seminar on modern monetary theory, mm. um, and they, they, they it was an interesting presentation. They said it's not theory; it's fact. Yeah, that sovereign states can never run out of cash because they print it, right? Um, but the the argument is that um, essentially uh, we all we need to do with money with a it, a government needs to do and how it raises um, or how it prints its cash is the, the question, whether it goes to the secondary market and actually issues bonds that are bought by private individuals or whether the Reserve Bank buys them. But um, the point of it is, when you look at the history of, um, it's quite interesting, the reality is that governments run deficits and um, that allows the private sector to run surpluses. And if you look back historically, it's a, it's a balanced it's like a balance sheet, basically. Yeah. Um, or, you yeah. Know, the, the, if, 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 if when we've run, when we've run government surpluses, we run private sector deficits, um, and it's it's a corollary. There's the foreign element, the, the you know the trade, which is another dimension. It complicates it a little bit. But I'm, my my sense of it is going to be an interesting debate. I don't know if I fully accept the theory, um, or accepted the idea that it's a fact. Um, but it is an interesting proposition when you look at the reality of where we are right now. Yeah. That we can spend so much money and it's not inflationary right now. Why? Well, because um, government's basically soaking up or creating demand um, for supply that would otherwise have no demand, essentially, to match That's it. That's right, Greg. And you raise some really good points there. Um, personally, I, I can say on a personal basis, not not really academic science, I, I think that that statement is true, but with a caveat, with the conditions apply. Yes, they can ring up these massive debts, but there is always a consequence when things approach a certain debt 
to GDP ratio, a sovereign issuing currency can do that to a much, much greater extent than say the Euro, where those individual member states don't have control over their currency. Um, so it's, it's my- yeah, that's, first... And that's- Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, that's, well, that's the problem for the, for the Eurozone generally. I mean, Germany does very well out of it, but everybody else suffers. Um, it's a whole other discussion. Yeah, but yeah. So it's it's interesting. It's going to be an interesting debate because it's sort of it's highlighted that government can perform a role of soaking up basically underutilized resources, provided it does not cause cost push inflation or demand sure. pull inflation, I should say. Um, yeah. uh, and it can do that. It can do that if it crowds out the private sector. But when you've got a situation like we're facing at the moment, there is uh, no private sector demand to yeah. basically to keep it going. Right. Greg, but it is an interesting I'll, exercise. Yeah, Greg, I'll, I'll add a few points to that um, before we go to our, ne our next question is that uh, the government, I, I think, in this instance, as opposed to when we had the GFC, uh, is, is really making some good choices. They are pushing um, funds that were already in place for a lot of large state and federal defence projects. They're bringing those forward because those buckets of cash, if you will, are already there. So that's exciting. There's civil infrastructure projects that are being brought forward um, where the money was already allocated. So really, we're, we're bringing stuff forward to maintain that that work. What you touched on has another big question, though, is and that is, what do we do after this? What does the end of the rainbow look like? And one of the theories that's being talked about, well, it's not a theory, it's a proven tool, is understanding the uh, level of debt, as I said, against the GDP. And sometimes countries have this cool little trick, if you like, where the amount of debt sits there, but over time as the economy grows, it becomes quite small or smaller compared to the overall size of the economy and its GDP. Um, it's a little bit, it's a little analogous to when we buy a home, you know, people that bought a home back in, say, 1990 might have got that house for $100,000 here in South Australia. Now that debt is reduced and compared to their income as employees and the value of the home, it's really a small debt to manage, but that's taken time to get there and interest has been paid in the meantime. The same is true on the macro level for an economy. So, Greg, amazing question. and and. There's so much we could unbox there. I think you and I need to catch up offline after this seminar. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thank you. Did thank you have you yeah, and th thank you to our Pro Vice Chancellor um, who's able to sort of make it today um, to, to today's session. Really excited. Um, we've got a, we've got another a few questions actually, so I'm not sure if we can rush through these. Okay. Um, we we had a question about you know the importance. How important is it to maximise? your personal development um, and educate yourself during this downtime? Um, let me let me answer that really simply. For some people, what else have you got to do? Right now, let's learn from this. You can sit on the couch and you can cry and do nothing, or you can learn from this, you can harden up. I wanna use just real strong layman's terms on this, guys, um, and move away from just economics because that's a personal question and it's a good one. It's time to use this to the fullest extent find the opportunity, find the strengthening scenario out of this and learn from this. Um, if you're studying right now in economics or business, see this as a fantastic time. Uh, we've just finished uh, uh, personally another semester of economics uh, at Oxford and we were comparing everything. All of a sudden went to, from comparing to the GFC to comparing to today. And what an exercise to study economics or business during this time. It's an opportunity in disguise and it's just time that we see it as that as, as academics and students. Fantastic. Thank you, Dan. And um, we had a really important question. What's your advice for international students that have lost their jobs due to the current, current scenario? What can yeah. they do? And I know you touched on it a little bit. Maybe yeah, we can get, and, and get back to it again. Yeah, and I'm glad that you saved this to the end, Mustafa, because this is, this is one that is dear to my heart. Again, it, uh, my heart goes out to any of you watching right now that have lost your employment in the face of this. Uh, I wanna wish you all the best, regardless of what happens. I know that it's difficult. Let me say this, it's time to simplify and it's time to go back to basics. It's okay when you have a negative like that in your life for it to shut you down and be upset, have a cry, get angry, all of those things. But at some point very quickly, you need to get past that and look at solving the problem, treat it like an equation 
and I've got two um, young individuals in, in their early 20s that I've met recently who were working in hospitality, one in a cinema um, that lost their jobs in the face of this. And you know what they've done? They've started doing anything that they can, and that includes painting houses. Um, they never painted houses before. They, they put ads on Gumtree. They started speaking to different individuals. They're working on renovation projects for people that are doing things in their home. And they've quickly just taken up sandpaper and paint and paintbrushes, got messy, got the job done, and they're making money. They're hustling. And this is the time to hustle. This is not the time to be upset for too long. It's the time to get excited and solve the equation. And I think you need to go into this. So let me answer the question with practical solutions. Pick up the phone, start calling businesses, start calling individuals, start calling family members, start calling friends. Um, get on to Seek, get onto every job platform, put ads onto Gumtree. What can you do? It's time to be humble about the work that, that we need to do. It doesn't matter. Um, if you are working and you're generating an income, you are in that almost a minority at this stage. So take it, whatever you can get, and go and find it with absolute gusto. Brilliant. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Dan. That's a that's a very uh, that's a brilliant piece of advice, actually. Um, I think this sort of brings us to, to an end for this session. Um, to all the academic students and guests that have attended today, um, thank you for your time. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. Um, Dan, it was incredible to hear your valuable insights particularly on what businesses are doing to survive, evolve and thrive in these in these tough times. I think we all appreciate the advice that you've put that you have provided our students, particularly on job opportunities that are available to them, you know, to get out of their comfort zone. Mm. Um, on behalf of Florence University Australia, thank you for presenting. Thank you for being here. It was a real privilege and honor to hear from you today. Thank you all. Thank you, Mustafa, and thank you everyone at Torrens University. It's been a pleasure. Good luck Brilliant. with everything. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.